Good morning and, and welcome again to worship at Chapel Street. I'm so glad you're here with us. I, uh, I had the opportunity, um, well, I've had the opportunity many times as a youth pastor to take our students over the years to various camps, uh, Expeditions Unlimited up in Wisconsin, El Refugio down in Ecuador outside of Quito. And one of the things that these camps do is that they'll offer team building or uh, leadership development in, as a part of their curriculum. And, and one, of the, one of the tools that they use in that are some of these high ropes courses. I don't know if you've ever done anything like this before, but our students enjoy it. It really does, it's, it's effective in, in helping them work together as a team. And so the very first summer I was in Ecuador in 2007, we were just wrapping up the trip. It was our last day and we had a little bit of extra time. And so the students wanted to go up and do some of the, the high ropes elements and the, the camp graciously agreed to open them up. And we went up there and one particular element that the kids were kind of uh, excited about was called Jacob's Ladder. And maybe you've seen something like this before, but I brought a picture this morning so that you can imagine this. But Jacob's Ladder is a series of rungs, if you will, that get progressively taller between each step. And you have to work together as a team in order to continue to climb up this ladder. And so the students all divided up and one of the kids came up and said, hey, would you, would you be my partner? And I sort of reluctantly agreed, but was willing to do it. Well, as luck would have it, the team that went immediately before us, uh, one of the students was like a, an incredibly gifted gymnast. And so their team just scaled it. Like in a few minutes, they, they made themselves all the way up to the top, success, everybody's cheering. And then it's, it's our turn to go. And, um, and it was uh, miserable. Um, I, I, my teammate and I, we got maybe about halfway up and you could, the, the students and the leaders that are watching all of this could kind of tell we're struggling. And, and, and they began to shout from the safety of the ground, you've got this, Sterling. Like, you can do this, you, you've got it. And they were lying to me because I did not have it. In fact, as, as the idea that somewhere inside of me laid the strength and the flexibility and the balance and the courage to complete the challenge was simply not true. As much as I might have wanted that to be true, as much as I might have wanted that to be the case, as much as the students were, were sincere and well-meaning in their encouragement, it, it wasn't true. I did not have what it takes. We're in a, a series this summer entitled, Did God Say That? Where we've been looking at these misconceptions, these misunderstandings that, that gain traction in, in our culture, and particularly sometimes even in the, in the church, in the Christian culture. And we're looking specifically today at this phrase or this saying that God won't give you more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that one? Have you ever said that one? Because it's, it's a little bit like a spiritualized version of you've got this. In fact, if I think about moments in my life when I've heard somebody say that to me, or, or if I've heard, uh, think of moments in my life when maybe I've even whispered in my own ear, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. I think if, if, if I'm honest, if I look at that situation, I look at the circumstances that I'm, I'm facing, oftentimes I have felt, and maybe you can relate to this, that God has drastically overestimated my ability. That, 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 that somehow either God has messed up in his assessment of what I am capable of or that, that I haven't enough faith in, in myself more or less to, to do or to act or to overcome whatever it is that's in front of me. E even when I have desperately wanted that to be true, when I've wanted that, that phrase, that saying to be real in my life, 
just just hearing it, it has always rung uh, untrue, incomplete. It is this nagging sense in the back of my head that that I don't have this, and that that what I'm dealing with is more than I'm capable of overcoming. And so a a slogan, a saying like this, no matter how well intended, no no matter how uh, we ultimately want to encourage somebody with it, when we hear it, it has this tendency to compound our sense of fear and frustration in the midst of, of pain or of uncertainty, or of a, re- a reality that exceeds our capacity to resolve. And so this morning, I, I want to take a few moments just to unpack this, to talk maybe a little bit about why we want it to be true, to look at a misplaced promise, and, and talk about a better answer. And so let's begin by looking at a misplaced promise, a misplaced promise. I think that that You'll relate to this. I, I think that we have a way in our faith of, of hearing what we want to hear. And not just in our faith, in, in life in general. We, we do this, right? If somebody says something to us and there's multiple interpretations of that, we have this tendency to, to, to hold on to the version that sounds most like what, what we want it to say. Just one quick example. Just this week, I, uh, I saw an advertisement that our cell phone carrier was had a sale or a deal on iPhones. And Sherry and I have been talking about needing to upgrade some of the phones and the, for the girls. And my oldest is, is going to go away to college in the fall. And so we've kind of wanted to get her something that's a little more reliable. So I was going to go over to the store and, and ask about this, this buy one, get one iPhone deal. And before I did that, I, I made the mistake of saying to my three daughters, hey, if, if this works out, if this is going to work for our family, what, what kind of phone would you want? What color, whatever, all that sort of thing. Now, in defense to me, I thought it was very clear in terms of saying if this works out, if this is going to be a fit. But what do you think my, my kids heard? What do you think my, my, a 12-year-old girl hears, hears when you say that, right? I, Dad's getting a new phone for me. Like, I'm getting a new phone. And when you come home and that's not the reality, it, it leads to, to disappointment. And I think this is, can be very true in the way that we approach Scripture. I guess I should say I, I, I can see this in my own heart and life. At times when I'm, I'm reading Scripture and I can look at what it's saying, I can look at the parts that, that affirm what I want to hear, and I can read right past the parts that, that I don't want to hear. And perhaps that's what we've done here. I want to read you a verse uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's verse 13, and it's, it's um, well, we're, I'm going to read it to you in two versions, and then we're going to talk a little bit about this. This is 1 Corinthians 13, or uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. This is from the New Revised Standard Version. This is what Paul writes. He says, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he'll not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you will be able to endure it. Now, here's that same verse in the New International Version. This is what I uh, most frequently teach from. Paul writes and says it this way, it's translated this way, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, this single verse is is often cited as biblical support for the idea that God won't give you more than you can handle. And to be fair, when we read that in, in the uh, New Revised Standard Version, it, it seems like a reasonable conclusion. But what we have to ask ourselves is, what is Paul's intent here? What, what does he want the church to understand? Is he teaching us that, that more or less that we've got this, that God's not going to give us more than we're going to get? What is this promise that, that he is uh, laying out for the church? And a lot of this comes down um, to, to our understanding and the translation of the Greek word paramasos. Paramasos. This word in, in the Greek, like so many words in English and Greek and other languages, can carry a variety of meanings. 
It can be translated anywhere from temptation to, to trial, which is another version of the Bible. The contemporary English version translates it as trial. It can mean a, a type of suffering or a testing as, as we see in the New Revised Standard Version. And sometimes, depending on, on context, it can carry a little bit of a combination of these meanings. So what is, what's Paul's intent here? Paul's, Paul, again, he's writing this letter to a group of followers of Jesus living in a town called Corinth. We've talked about this before, but, but Corinth was a, 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 a prominent city. It was very metropolitan. Um, it was strategically placed for commerce and transportation. It was, it was a very diverse city both in its culture and in its practice of, of religion. Uh, overlooking the city of Corinth was the famed temple of, of Aphrodite. And so when Paul, on his missionary journey, came to Corinth and he began to teach people about who Jesus is and, and what he had accomplished in his death and resurrection, and he began to convey and teach about salvation being available through him, the people that were responding to that message, for many of them, they were leaving, leaving behind this practice of, of pagan worship that was the common expression in their city. What they knew, which was defined by idolatry and gluttony and drunkenness and temple prostitution and sexual immorality and this this whole thing, and they're walking away from this, and they're, they're walking towards life in Christ. And so Paul now has, has moved on. He's left the people there, and despite the fact that they, they've left this life behind, they, they reside in this city. It, it, it surrounds them every day, and, and they're struggling. They're, they're struggling with the draw to, to revert to this who they were prior to Christ, to go back into these expressions of, of this pagan worship that they had left behind. And Paul is, is speaking into this. Paul, Paul's addressing this pull in their life to, to return to a version, um, an old creation, if you will, who they were prior to Christ. And, and he wants to empower them with a promise. See, the immediate context, if we were to look at the rest of, of this passage, is really about God's promise in the midst of the pull of, of sin, not, not specifically of suffering. In verse 6, Paul talks about not setting our hearts on evil things. In verse 7, he talks about being careful not to be idolatrous. In verse 8, he talks about sexual immorality. In verse 9, he talks about being careful not to test Christ, not to be accusatory against God. In verse 10, he talks about grumbling against God, right? Paul's, Paul's point to the church, the promise, is not that you and I contain inside of us everything that we need to, to resolve the issues that we're facing in our lives. It's not about inner strength that, that we have that allows us to overcome the challenges or suffering that come our way. We'll talk more about this in a minute, but Paul, Paul's going to give us an expectation that, that we will find ourselves in situations that are beyond our strength. Rather here, Paul's pointing us to the fact that when we are drawn or we're tempted to revert back to this pre-Jesus transforming us way of life, this old creation, right? The old is gone and the new has come. That, that Jesus has provided for us a promise. That, that he has provided for us a way out. And so he says into this, when you find yourself in this situation, and, and, and we so frequently do, he says this, God is faithful. He says, God is faithful. He says, God will not tempt you beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, God will provide a way out. Th these are the promises that Paul is laying out in, in the circumstances to which we can apply them. So when, when we have a misplaced promise, not only do we compound the experience of, of trial and suffering in our lives with this myth that somehow God has given us the ability in and of ourselves to, to kind of power through it, we, 
we also miss the, the actual promise that God intends for us. That in the midst of temptation, that he will provide a way for us to overcome sin. And I think that is the danger here, that in believing something that isn't true, we are also failing to believe something that is true. God never told us that, that things won't come our way that are more than we can handle. But he has promised us that when we are tempted to revert to a way of life that was defined by who we were before we were in Christ, that he would be faithful to us, that, that he would provide a way out for us. And I want to think for a minute about about why this, this sort of phrase gains traction in, in our hearts and our lives. And I think it begins with a misplaced expectation. I think it stems from a misplaced expectation. I, uh, when I was a, an early teenager, my, my family planned this vacation to Florida. Um, and so as it so happened, we had gotten the mail that, that um, there was this resort in Florida and we had won this um, kind of extended weekend stay there. And so we loaded up the family van, we, we made the 20 plus hour drive down to Florida and, and we arrived, it was really late at night. Um, and up at the door to the office, we saw this envelope that was taped to the door and it had our names on it, sort of assumed like this is the, the keys, the resort. We could already tell it was beautiful. We had seen all the pictures. It was Oceanside. There was an amazing pool. Like we're just, you're exhausted, but you're excited at the same time. And as my, my dad opened up the envelope to, uh, that was taped on the door there with our name on it, inside of it was not the keys to our room. Um, it was a printed out reservation at the Motel 6, just down the road, with, with directions on how to get there. Um, see, we, we were, it was kind of like one of those timeshare things uh, where they wanted you to buy in, but we weren't staying at the resort. We were staying at a, a cheap motel just, just down the road, right? And if we had gone there with the assumption that that's where we were staying, um, that would have set our expectations. When we went anticipating a, a resort, a lavish sort of beautiful place, right, the result was being disillusioned and discouraged and defeated. You know, I spent a lot of time, I don't, I, today we're not gonna, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this today, but I, I think it's important in the midst of this conversation to point out that Paul's expectation is not that God won't give you more than you can handle, right? But rather that he will. And, and, and we have to frame this, like Pastor Jeff talked about the sovereignty of God a couple of weeks ago, and we won't dive back into that. But the, in terms of whether God gives it to us, whether he allows it, it's the, we understand it in the role of his sovereignty. But Paul's expectation is not that life for us is going to be limited by what you and I can handle. In fact, if you, if he continue on in his conversation with the church in Corinth, you can flip over to his second letter to the Christians there. Just one example of, of what Paul says or of, of a situation that's more than he can handle. This is what he writes to the Christians living in Corinth. He says this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had, we, we, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And he has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again on him. We have set our hope that we, that he will continue to deliver us. All right. Paul speaks directly to the church and he says, I don't want you to be uninformed about what we faced. God, God allowed us. He gave us more than we can handle to the point that we thought we were going to die, to die. And, and then he stepped in and delivered us. If you, again, if you flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
He says it this way. This is chapter four, verse seven. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, the treasure being the message of the gospel and the jars of clay being the, the um, fragile nature of, of our humanness, of who we are. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We all carry around us in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body, right? We have this, this incredible message, this, this treasure in these fragile jars of clay so that the all-surpassing power of God might be on display, Paul writes. I mentioned earlier that we have a tendency to hear what we want to hear. And I think that sometimes a, a saying like God won't give you more than you can handle gains traction in, in our hearts and our lives because we want to believe that that's the case. That the boundaries on my experience of difficulty, that the, what it's going to look like for me to follow Jesus is going to fall within the confines of what I can handle. And for Paul, he just, it's completely foreign to him. The idea that somehow there is this, this governor that life might get tough, but, but only to the point that, that I have the power inside of me to management, that is, is absolutely foreign to the theology of Paul. In fact, I think this is, this is one of the dangers that we can find in kind of like the, the health and wealth gospel or the prosperity gospel is that life should be expected to fall into a category of a certain level of comfort and ease and manageable bumps in the road. And so in our North American minds, we, we, can, we can pretty quickly adapt a version of that. But for Paul, Paul says, church, I don't, I don't want you to be uninformed. It, the idea of that is completely foreign to his experience of following Jesus. You can't read through his letters to New Testament churches and not find in almost every single letter a statement, a phrase, or an entire passage where he's preparing the church to deal with genuine, difficult circumstances, suffering. So in Paul's mind, as he's preparing the church, as he's teaching them, he's thinking, you, you are going to have more than you can handle. This should be your expectation. Perhaps we, we say things like, you got this, and, and God won't give you more than you can handle because we want it to be the, the case but it's a misplaced expectation and misplaced expectations will lead us to disillusioned and defeated faith. So Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, I, I, don't, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be uninformed about we suffered, but I want to tell you about how Jesus delivered us, which I think leads us to a better, a, a better answer, a better response. And this is the third thing I want us to look at this morning. This is, again, Paul's conversation letter with the church in, in Corinth. And I want to read this passage to you, and then we'll talk a bit about it. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 now. We're going to pick it up halfway through verse 7. Paul writes this. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being, becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties for when I am weak, then I am strong. This, this, those few verses will always hold a special place in my heart. It was the, the text 
that I preached from on the very first week that the Mill Creek campus gathered as, as a launch team um, to prepare. And it, it connected in so many ways because as we were readying ourselves for that, there was so much about that experience that felt beyond my ability, beyond what I could handle. And what I love about these few verses is that this isn't, this isn't just Paul's advice to the church when they're experiencing pain and suffering and more that they can handle. These are the words of Jesus to Paul when he finds himself in that place. And I just, I want to just point out two aspects of Jesus' answer to Paul here that I think provide for us a better answer, a better response. First, that grace is sufficient. Grace is sufficient. This, if we had time, this, this deserves way more attention than what I'm going to give it today. But if I could describe the hope of these words somewhat succinctly, I think that, that they teach us that when we are given more than we can handle, when we feel overwhelmed and exhausted and in over our heads, when we find ourselves in a place of suffering, of, of genuine suffering, I think Jesus is speaking to Paul in that place and he's saying, as difficult as what you're facing is, as difficult as what you're dealing with, it will not outpace my grace for you. My grace will not run out. In other words, Jesus is saying to Paul and to us as well is in a relationship with me, the grace that I'm giving you, I am providing you with everything that you need that my grace is enough. It's all that you'll ever need. For Paul, his suffering isn't removed. It doesn't go away. It doesn't just power through. It's met with grace. And it's met in a relationship with the one who is grace. But secondly, we discovered that it's in the midst of this weakness, of this difficulty, that it becomes a platform for his power to be displayed. It becomes a platform for his power. He says, my, my power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't this a better answer? Not that, that God is going to limit our experiences and circumstances to to the things that we can handle, to our own ability to, to overcome, right? Paul has already instructed us that we will face things that are over our head. We should expect it, in fact. But when we find ourselves in that place, when we find ourselves in that moment that we can hold on and cling to the truth that his grace is sufficient, that it's all that we need, in that in giving that grace to us in the midst of our weakness, that his power in our lives is going to be put on display. Right? Paul, Paul does not dismiss our painful and difficult experiences in life, but rather in the midst of them, he speaks God's grace and he speaks the display of his power. And I think it's a better answer. Like so many of you, um, I have found these last four or five months and then these, again, these last uh, four or five weeks to be a, a place of um, where I'm overwhelmed and I'm in over my head and I feel like I don't have the answers to provide. And, and certainly COVID has done that. And, and then again, as the church, as we're dealing with and looking honestly and having conversations about racism and racial injustice and what is the church's role and how do I respond as a follower of Jesus? And I've been trying to sit down with brothers and sisters in Christ of color and to talk with them and to listen and to pray together and, and to speak grace into each other's life and trying to, to come before Jesus and think about, Lord, what is... What role are you having us play in this? And what does it look like? And we want to follow you in obedience. And when we look at this kingdom vision that he's given us as, as the church, when we, 
when we look at, at the situation and understand how he has this picture and revelation of every tribe, tongue, and language surrounding the throne of God and worshiping and praising, when we understand that our theology says that every man, woman, child is an image bearer of our great God and of eternal value and worth, and he's left us here as the church, and he says, I want you to, to take this kingdom vision and I want you to advance it. And so many of us, are feeling overwhelmed and, and perhaps discouraged and wondering, okay, Lord, how, where, what do we do next? Where do we go? Like Jeff was, was talking about that. People saying, well, what are you doing? And, and, and sometimes I have felt in the midst of that question, I didn't always have the answer. Trying to understand what do you call us to? And here's the reality. As followers of Jesus, for you and I, whether it's COVID or whether it's racial injustice or whatever circumstance we're facing right now, we are in over our heads. We have more than we can handle. We do not have this, right? But we cannot run away from this kingdom vision that God has given us. The church is not only a part of, of the solution, the church is to lead the way. That's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. And so in the midst of that, if I can just encourage you, that I think as we continue to wrestle through this, any of these circumstances, that we are audibly going to need to say to each other from time to time, in the midst of our weakness, his grace is sufficient. We are going to need to speak grace into each other's lives. And we are going to pray together that in our weakness, his power would be on display. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you again for the opportunity just to come into your word and, and to be challenged by it and transformed by it. And Lord, I want to, I want to ask that the, the moments when I want to read your word and I want it to, to tell me what I want to hear and and I want to read right past the things that I don't want to hear. Lord, would you, would you forgive me of that? Lord, I want to cling to the promise that in the midst of temptation, when sin is trying to draw me away from relationship with you and into a, a old pattern of doing things, Lord, that you are faithful and that you have provided a way out. Lord, we, we acknowledge today our weakness. And we proclaim together that your grace is sufficient and that your power is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, do this in us and we ask these things in your name. Amen.